first time I do it for real. Yeah. One, two. One, two. Well, good afternoon. Uh, just before we start today's seminar, uh, just please be aware of the exit signs in case we need to leave on short notice. And the hallway will take you to wherever they want you to go in case we leave to uh, leave the uh, building. Um, for those that are on the internet, uh, we strongly uh, uh, advise you to consider sending your emails at first opportunity so that we could have time enough for the Q&A to have them uh, answered. So with that, Peggy. Thank you. And good morning and welcome everybody to uh, our seminar today. Uh, Dr. Yifang Zhu is an associate professor at the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Zhu has conducted innumerable studies of uh, personal exposure in vehicle studies. She's an exposure, indoor air quality and air quality uh, expert you know, has many, many areas of expertise, uh, aerosol science and technology. She's just very knowledgeable. We've been really very happy to have her conduct this in vehicle study for us. Uh, she's the winner of a number of national awards that have recognized her expertise and her many accomplishments. She received her PhD in environmental health sciences from UCLA in 2003. And she is uh, an associate professor of the Environmental Health Sciences Department in the School of Public Health at UCLA. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Zhu and uh, welcome. All right, thank you for the opportunity to present our work on um, some in-cabin uh, pollution reduction using high efficiency uh, cabin air filters. Uh, before I get to the, um, the real uh, presentation, I want to make sure that um, the statements and conclusions that we're presenting today are just ours, not representing what ARB and NSF's um, position. And the mention of commercial products and their sources uses in connection with all the material that I'm presenting and data I'm presenting today is just um, not to be uh, constructed as actual implied endorsement of such products. The reason we're interested in um, the in-cabin environment is previously, we have measured ultrafine particles on Los Angeles freeways, and we found their levels are very high, usually on the orders of uh, 10, 10 to 100, sometimes even a million particles per cubic centimeter. To put that into perspective, while we're sitting in this room, nice clean um, indoor air room, that like every breath that we take in, we're still breathing in um, particles on the orders of a million with each breath that we're taking in. Imagine when we get stuck in traffic, when there's uh, um, super emitters or uh, some dirty trucks around us, every breath we take in, we're breathing particles on the orders of a billion. So even the commute time itself is short relative, relative to our 24 hours of day, um, but that 6% of commute time can translate sometimes to 30 or 80%, 50% of uh, the total exposures uh, for 24 hour. And this is just because when we're driving inside our cars, we're very much in the source, very close to the emission sources. The vehicle envelopes uh, tend to be very leaky. So what is on the freeway tend to get into the cars. And the passenger vehicles, even though some comes already with a fil filter in it, the filtration efficiencies for those commercially available filters tend to be low. And for school buses, um, there are just not many um, buses that come with very effective filtration system. And some of the buses don't even have any ventilation system or AC uh, to start with. So here is um, one of our previous work where we um, measured ultrafine particle levels inside a passenger vehicle together with uh, carbon dioxide concentrations inside the same vehicle. And we collect data under two conditions when the ventilation system was set either to recirculation, where the air just goes through um, the, the ventilation so, uh, system itself, or going through uh, all door air mode, as indicated by OA here. Uh, as you can see, the recirculation mode 
and the recirculation mode, the in-cabin um, CO2 levels goes up very, very high. Uh, well, the cabin uh, particle number concentrations can kept pretty low. The CO2 really comes from the passenger exhaled um, uh, breath, not necessarily from the vehicle tailpipes. But once, once you shut down the air exchange rate by turning on your recirculation, that little icon in your car, the air only recirculates, so CO2 builds up. The moment we um, turn the, um, the ventilation system to OA mode, CO2 levels drop very quickly. But the actual fine particle levels go up, just tracking, just like track the outdoor um, on freeway particle levels here. And you turn on the recirculation, particle starts to reduce, but the CO2 starts to build up. So overall, we, 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 we realize that by turning on the recirculation can provide some protections for particle exposure. But the trade-off is the passenger exhaled CO2 levels builds up. At, at 2,500 ppm CO2 with just only two passengers inside the car for a few minutes, um, it's not an air toxic CO2 per se, but some recent studies showing that CO2 levels at that level, 2,500 um, ppm, can impact decision making. For example, this study shows when the CO2 level is above 25 ppm, 2500 ppm, it will impact initiation, breadth of approach, and basic strategy. Those are the things that you don't want to be impeded while you're driving on the very busy freeways. So our goal is to see if there's a way that we can deal with both ultrafine particle levels and CO2 inside the car simultaneously without treating off uh, one of another. We're also interested in children. Well, first of all, because they're a susceptible population. They have immature respiratory system. They take in more air per their body weight for each breath. Um, they have larger uh, minute, minute ventilation relative to their uh, lung size. And each breath they take in, there's actually higher percentage particles that deposit in their uh, respiratory system. So overall, children are very sensitive. And recent studies, this is a study that just published uh, from the Children's Health Study in Southern California, they basically demonstrated when the air gets cleaner, children's lung function becomes stronger. Right? Over the past 30, 40 years, when the Los Angeles air quality PM levels reduced, the lung function improved in children. So cleaner air, healthy kids. Everything, every measure that we can make to make the air cleaner, reduce exposures among our children, will likely have some improved um, impacts on their health. And when it comes to uh, environments that children are exposed to high levels of potential particular pollutants, a uh, school bus is a very unique microenvironment. Previous study funded also by California Air Resource Board have demonstrated that children are exposed to very high levels of air pollutants while they're riding inside school buses. And those pollutants come, can either come from the bus itself, which we call them self pollution, or they can come from um, the surrounding vehicles, super emitters or dirty trucks that is next to the buses on the road. And US EPA and also California Resource Board, South Coast, they all put lots of resources to retrofitting those um, dirty diesel buses by putting in um, diesel oxidative catalyst, crankcase filtration system, and recent years, uh, diesel particulate filters. Those retrofitting technology certainly helps to reduce tailpipe emissions greatly but not necessarily translate into an improved in-cabin air quality. The reason behind that is it's not just the bus tailpipe itself that is polluting the bus cabin. It's all the vehicle emissions that is surrounding the buses that contribute um, together to what is inside the school bus that children are breathing. And, and in, in the U.S., there are a very large number of children um, get carried around by school buses for uh, uh, many, many, many days uh, for a decade. And so working on the microenvironment inside school buses seems to be a cost-effective and reasonable way to further protect children's health and reduce their exposure to particular pollutants. So this basically motivated us to go in parallel with what ARB has been working on, the tailpipe emissions standard tightening, improving fuel efficiencies to cut down the emissions from tailpipes. In parallel to this effort, we are trying to work directly inside the, the cabin environments for both passenger vehicles and for school buses. So the study was designed in two phases. In the first phase, we focused on passenger vehicles. In collaboration with IQAir, we developed high efficiency cabin air filters and we test them against commercially available um, 
uh, uh, filters on the market, and then trying to see to what extent those high efficiency filters can reduce uh, pollutant levels inside passenger vehicles. In the phase two of this project, in the phase two of this project, we adapt a, a, a onboard system that using the IQAIR high efficiency filters, and then we test it against whether it's on or off to evaluate uh, how does the system reduce particle levels inside buses. So let's start to look at first um, the passenger vehicle uh, part of the project. So these two pictures shows uh, the high efficiency carbon filter filter um, AcuAir provided. Uh, there are two different types. We call them HICA A filter and HICA B filter for, for, the, for today's presentation and for data um, um, purposes. Uh, both uh, filters, as, as shown by this um, SEM image, as you can see, they are much, much thinner than the um, original equipped manufacturer filters that is on the market. Um, the diameter of those fibers is typically on the order, so just for the HICA A is one micron, for HICA B is 0.4 to 0.8 micron. In comparison, the traditional uh, uh, commercially available filters are usually on the order of two to five micrometers. And aerosol physics will tell us when the fiber diameter reduced, both diffusion and interception mechanisms will increase. Um, that will help to collect particles, especially particles, smaller size particles, particles in the nucleation mode. And the difference between the HICA A type of filter and HICA B type of filter, as you can see, the B type filter is even, is even thinner, right? the diameter is even smaller. So that will increase, um, give, provide even higher efficiency, but at the cost of a little bit more pressure drop, which I'll also show you the data momentarily. So we apply this um, type of filters to 12 um, passenger vehicles that we recruited uh, from um, uh, California uh, vehicle fleet. The, this is um, a, a small scale uh, project, so we're not trying to represent the California uh, vehicle fleet statistically. Um, uh, instead, we try to select different type of uh, um, model vehicle makers and models that are popular in the fleet. And, and when selecting those vehicles, we take into account of uh, the vehicle types and their uh, cabin sizes. So there are some smaller ones, and there are some relatively large SUVs and mini ones. I will try to only work on uh, relatively newer vehicles. The, the rationale behind that is uh, the newer vehicles tend to have more, higher percentage of uh, coming with in-cabin filters, and those are probably the vehicles that eventually will likely have um, the, um, the likelihood to get retrofitted with high efficiency filters. So the study was done under uh, outdoor air mode, the OA mode. Yeah, as, as I mentioned, if we run, run it in the recirculation mode, then we know we're gonna um, have good control on atrophin particles, but the CO2 levels will likely to build up because passengers exhale CO2 inside the cabin. So we, we run the system, um, the ventilation system for every single car under OA mode, and use medium fan setting. And then uh, we tested four different filtration scenarios, like HICA A filter, B filter, the in-use uh, originally equipped manufacturer filters, and no filter cases. And the data were collected under three driving conditions, uh, either when the vehicle was parked stationary at a background site, or was driving on local street, or we take it onto freeway. So this map shows uh, where we collect our data in Southern California. This picture shows the setup for our instruments. Um, we have data collected always uh, simultaneously in and out of the car. So we have uh, one set of equipment that collect particle um, size distribution, um, atrophin particle number concentration, PM 2.5 mass concentration, and black carbon concentration inside the car. And then we have identical set of equipment that we use to collect um, the same type of pollutants that is outside of the car. Right, so this picture shows where the probe for outside and inside look like for passenger vehicles. So this is um, just show you uh, what the uh, particle size distribution look like uh, for outside. This is all outside of the vehicles. While the vehicle is parked at a stationary location or drives on some local road, and then eventually we take them on the freeways. Well, one thing you can see, this is a particle size distribution diameters, uh, normalize the size distribution. Right. Under stationary conditions and local conditions, the particle levels are much lower than on the freeway. 
And it's more strikingly, is, is, as, as many literature has shown, that the freeway aerosols tend to have this nucleation mode, um, the size that is around 30 nanometers, very, very small um, ultrafine particles. And later on, we'll see because the freeway aerosols have this unique set of fusions and it's dominated by particles in the 30 nanometer size range. The HECA A filter and HECA B filter we developed for this project works extremely well for, for this uh, freeway scenarios. So when we put it together, when we put the uh, data together and then plot it here for um, ultrafine particle reductions, so this uh, percentage reduction is, in, is one minus uh, I/O ratio, in cabin over outdoor or on freeway ratio. So the production for um, the HECA-B type of filter goes to 93%. It shows when you have the uh, HECA-B filter installed inside the car, only 7% of the outdoor aerosol particles gets into the car, okay? And you see the HECA-A gets to about 75%. The OEM filter, originally equipped manufacturer EU's filters, only have 40 to 60%. And even a car that without any filters can have 20 to 50% of protection. So this is just because the ventilation system have turns and twists and the air comes in, have to make turns just and, and the particle have time to diffuse and to impact. So we lose some particles just by going through the ventilation system. So the current OEM filter really didn't add too much to what the car on um, the system itself can offer. But by using the HECA A or HECA B filter, we can really improve this protection from 20 to 50 or roughly 50% up to uh, over 90%. And it also reduced um, the variability of the data that we collected. So the difference is when we statistically test difference between the HECA A and HECA B type of filter against the OEM filter, the, the, the difference is the improvement is all statistically significant. And the reason behind this good data we think is because the HECA B and HECA A type of filter works extremely well for ultrafine particles, especially in the uh, nucleation mode size range. So this table, this figure shows particle size and in cabin ultrafine particle reduction as a function of particle size. As you can see, the filters that we used for this study have a pretty high uh, collection efficiencies reductions throughout the size we measured versus the in, um, the in use OEM filters and the new filter cases. They're okay for larger ones, but they really decay a lot when the particle size becomes smaller, right? So we, 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 we think that the filter works so well, especially for freeway cases, is because those filters works for nucleation mode aerosols. And the time that it takes for those filters to work is almost no time. It's instantaneously, very quickly. So this, this, this plot is a little bit complicated. I'll take a, a few minutes to explain. Each color plot shows a contoured particle size fusion. The x-axis is the time, elects time, things the measurement start, and the y-axis on each plot is particle size in log um, scale. And the color on this plot shows particle concentration for a given for a given size at a given time, right? And it's also a log scale in color. Red color mean, meaning there's more particles for this size um, at that time, at that time, right? So the left panel shows what is going on outside on freeway, and the right panel shows what is inside, inside a vehicle. The top shows when the vehicle is parked at a stationary site, and the bottom panel shows when the vehicle is driven on freeways. So as you can see, first of all, just comparing the outside, like the previous slide shows, the freeway aerosols have much more um, particles, and they are usually small. Uh, in the 20, 30 nanometer size range. So it's lots of nucleation aerosols um, on the freeway environment. And if you're comparing the left and the right, you see the colors for the right panels are much greener, bluer, comparing to the right, comparing to the left. That meaning lots of the particles get removed uh, by turning on, um, by using this, um, um, the, um, the HECA filters in, inside the car. So the car inside the vehicles, the particle concentration are a lot less than the outside when the vehicle is parked. And then this reduction is even greater, is actually a order of magnitude different what we see uh, when we measure inside the car with a uh, HECA filter comparing to what is on the freeway. 
And the differences happens right away, right after the data start collection. It doesn't really take much time for the filter to work, right? It, it happens, it works very fast. And then there's always trade-off when you go for um, a high efficiency for um, cabin filters, there's a trade-off is usually those filters tend to have a higher pressure drop. Right? We're aware of that and we did uh, measurements to document uh, how much pressure drop um, does, uh, this, uh, using this HICA A and HICA B type of filters can really cause. So here we use a benchmark um, when the vehicle is parked and it's just uh, operating um, on average across all the 12 vehicles we tested uh, at medium fan setting as our, um, the benchmark that we're comparing with. So as you can see, for HICA A type of filters, yeah, sometimes the, the parked uh, condition is a little bit less, but when you drive on freeways and, and local streets, the, um, the speed of the vehicle and the pressure that's created by the driving speed actually compensate some of the pressure job that is caused by the filter itself, right? The HICA B type of filters um, have 20% reduction when it's parked and have about 8% of a reduction for, um, for the, uh, the flow when, when it's uh, driving on the freeway. So overall, we think the air flow reduction is about less than 10%. And, and the air flow is mainly um, uh, for thermal comfort uh, reasons. And remember, we set the study, uh, when we did a study, we set the fan, fan settings to medium. So there is still room that we can adjust to compensate for the reduced uh, flow rate going through the vent. And to go back, visit our, um, the dilemma that I, I, um, I mentioned at the beginning for the passenger vehicle part of the study is we need to control, we want to control both atrophine and uh, carbon dioxide at the same time. And, and, and we did accomplish that goal in this study. So this data shows, again, this is the last time, and on the left is particle IO ratio, right? On the, uh, the right, y-axis is the CO2 IO ratio, right? The DOS shows the data, average data, and then the area, the green, a shaded area um, shows the, um, the standard deviation. So as you can see, when we go from um, atrophon IO with just whatever the filter comes with the car, to the filter that we developed for the study, the IO ratio reduced a lot, right? IO ratio is the percentage of uh, what is outside can comes into the car. So, so, so meaning the car is more protective in that sense, okay? And then if we turn on the recirculation, well, first of all, the IO ratio start off uh, pretty low because the recirculation itself can remove a lot of the particles. But if you turn on the recirculation and use a high efficiency filter, then you can have further reductions for the IO ratio. The trade-off here again is the CO2 levels will go up. Right? So this is again just with two passengers inside the car, a couple of minutes, the CO2 levels can reach 2,500 ppm. And we know that will have some impact on decision makings. And versus when we use the OA mode, and the high efficiency filter in it, we can still uh, keep a reasonable IO ratio for atrophon particles, and we keep the CO2 in, uh, uh, levels inside the car reasonably uh, well. Right? This is a considered on freeway CO2 levels, it's usually on the order of 500 to 600 uh, ppm. Uh, with people exhaling our CO2 inside the cars, I think this level is very reasonable. So to summarize um, the phase one of the study, well, we achieve a simultaneous control for atrophine particles and CO2 using the filters that AQR developed for us. And we see, we observed approximately 93% reduction for in-cabin atrophines. And I want to emphasize this 93% reduction is a field data, it's a field average. So this is to incorporate all the potential leakage around the vehicle envelopes. If we test those filters um, fully sealed, in laboratory settings, um, then there's, there are more than 99% um, removal for atrophines. But this is a considering uh, driving the vehicles and leakage around the vehicle envelopes that we have 93% reduction for in-cabin atrophines. There is a concern about the thermal comfort issues and flow reductions due to the resistance build up pressure um, for those high efficiency filters. Uh, but we found it's less than uh, 10% on freeways, right? 
and the reduction is more effective on in especially uh, in freeway environment. Uh, and, and the reason behind that is because the freeway environment have a higher levels of nucleation mode particles, and the filters works extremely well for those particles uh, because the fibers are thinner, the diffusion and interception mechanisms just works very well to collect those particles uh, by those high efficiency filters. And then, oh, and, and the very last is the CO2 levels. We keep it below uh, 1,000 ppm. 1,000 ppm, although it's, it's actually recommended indoor standards for some cases. And then versus where if you use recirculation mode, the CO2 levels can go beyond uh, 25 ppm or 100, 100 ppm, and that could um, have some decision um, making uh, impacts. So that's the phase one study. The phase two study is, <coughs> is done on school buses. We essentially, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we used the Hika B type of filter, the same type of filter, but we developed a standing along system for, for buses to use. So as I mentioned, the buses that we tested um, for this particular study don't have any um, ventilation system or AC system to, uh, to, uh, to retrofit with. So we have to develop something standing along just for the buses. So as you can see, there are, so these are the diffuser, inlet diffusers, where, where they hold um, this high, uh, these high efficiency filters. And then the air uh, diffuse and it gets, get, get draw through those holes into that and get filtered out and they get pumped out through those ducts. And we hook up the electricity, there's a clearly a motor involved and to, to, to pump air through. And then the electricity can be collected directly uh, through the battery of the buses. So as long as the bus is running, we get power to run this unit. And in this study, we have two different ways to, uh, to deliver the air from the filter air in, in inside the whole buses. For uh, small uh, size buses, small and medium size buses, we use this jet diffuser uh, system. It's basically have this um, jet that's shooting the air against the roof of the bus and the fluid dynamic will push the air forward and then eventually it will turn back and then uh, get filtered uh, again by the, um, the filters that is, uh, that, that is uh, positioned uh, on the bottom of those uh, units. The other uh, system that we used for a large size buses is this distribution duct system. It's very much similar to um, what you can imagine an uh, uh, airplane duct system. So the, the air goes through this flexible ducts and we punch holes, different numbers of holes as we move uh, from the back to the front to make sure that the air coming out of the duct is evenly distributed across the length of the buses. So the air get, um, if that, that comes out of those holes and then turn down and circulate back and then get filtered and then do it again and again. So we use two different uh, systems for different size of buses. The results is actually pretty, pretty comparable. So we lump the data and then show it in the next uh, couple of slides. So in this study, we test six school buses because the buses doesn't have a, a manufacturer equipped filter to compare with, we can only compare our data whether we turn on the system or we not turn on the system. So the data were compared with without operating the onboard HECA filtration system. And again, we used three driving conditions, stationary, local, and freeway. And we tested, we measured actual fine particle black carbon and uh, PM 2.5. So here's the data that for the six buses we tested. As you can see, it covers um, a, a wide range of passenger capacity, some small, some medium, some large buses. And then they, uh, they use different fuels and the engine was at different locations. So we want also, again, we want to see a range of different buses from different uh, makers. So we want to get a range of buses to see if the system works. And all the diesel buses that we uh, tested in the study, they were all equipped with diesel particular filters. So here is the setup, right? We have uh, the on-road sampling probe going out of the buses, and then we actually have uh, more than one sampling location inside the buses. We want to also see the spatial distributions in that. But in, for, for today's talk, where I'm going to mainly focus on what is going outside and what is measuring towards the end uh, for the in-cabin sampling. We're going to compare in those data to see how effective the systems are in terms of reducing pollutant level, particle levels inside the bus cabin. The test route, we have a, a stationary sampling conditions and, and then a local route 
uh, and then a freeway route. The, the local route and freeway route are selected from um, the real um, uh, existing uh, school bus service route in Southern California. And while we collect the data, we basically mimic uh, what uh, those buses will, will, will how, how it basically going to operate uh, while they are running on the local route and freeway route. We stop and open the doors to simulate pickup and job off. Uh, we couldn't do the study with children on board for logistic and liability issues. We're working on it. Um, but so far, the data we collected uh, was no, with no children, only, only, only researchers uh, inside the buses. So here comes the data, right? So this is showing as a function of time, um, the particle, atrophic particle concentration for no filter cases, uh, we will have the HECA filter um, running, right? So the data was split into a freeway condition where the concentration is high, the gray area shows what is outside the bus, and the solid line shows what is inside, what is measured inside the buses. As you can see, without operating the HECA filtration system, uh, on the freeways we get high levels of particles, right? The bus inside sometimes can be even higher because one of the peaks can get in and stays. This is especially clear, clear to see here when the bus was driven from a freeway environment to a more uh, cleaner residential area where the pollutant levels outside dropped, dropped significantly. But what happened is the peaks that coming from the freeway stays inside the bus and lingering a long, a long time didn't really go away. And it makes um, the indoor, the in-cabin, to our way, uh, ratios could be greater than one in this case. But when you turn on the HECA filtration, it's a different story. Right? First of all, the inside bus levels was always lower than what is outside. Right? And then the peaks that is coming from freeway does get into the inside, but it got removed and reduced uh, quite clearly. So when we put all those data together, we're comparing uh, what we measured on, on road on freeway and what we measured in cabin inside the buses uh, without and uh, with operating uh, the HECA filtration system. So you see for atrophin particles, um, we, even without operating uh, anything, the on road is generally higher than inside. The bus itself is also, just like building, provides certain uh, level of protections against what is outside. Particle does need to penetrate through, it got lost and, and through the cracks and deposit diffused to the surfaces, right? The stars indicate where, where, where the difference is, um, has a p-value less than 0.001. Even for the local cases, where the p-value is not that small, but it's still less than 0.05. So there are measurable significant reduction even without operating the HECA filtration system for atrophin particles. But what is striking is to see here is not only when you turn on the HECA filtration system, not only does this difference uh, stay significant, and the, the, the real difference, if you're comparing them, the, the median values of those bars, it dropped an order of magnitude, right? It's much lower than what you have uh, without um, operating the system. But if you're comparing the gray bars for the two cases, they're very comparable. They're similar. They're on a similar level across the board, whether you're opening, uh, you're running it, or you don't run, you don't run it, you didn't run it. But the inside, you're, you're turning on the filtration system, the inside levels really reduced a lot, really reduced a lot. A similar result was observed for black carbon for, uh, for the filtration on um, cases, but we have seen something uh, weird or interesting, you may say, you may call it, uh, for local and freeway cases, where the in-cabin levels is actually higher than the outside, right? We didn't see that for atrophin particles, where we did see it for black carbon and for PM 2.5. And then we went through our raw data more carefully and we realized this is driven by uh, two buses, two of the buses that we tested. One of them is diesel bus, one of them is CNG bus. Um, and it is potentially we're thinking either just because the bus driven from a very high level pollutant environment into low, environment, low pollutant environment, where the pollutant level stays high, then it causes it to, um, to show up high. Or it could be potentially still self pollution going on for this particular two buses. So that is a, it really it deserves further, um, further research to really understand um, the reason behind this. Similar results were observed for PM uh, 2.5, where um, these two buses also has a higher levels 
uh, inside than the on, on the way. And then the PM um, 2.5 reduction when the filtration system is on is also, um, is also noted here. Well, one thing you notice is that the reduction is not as dramatic as what we uh, just show you for the ultrafine particles. Nevertheless, the filtration system is on will keep the PM 2.5 levels uh, clearly be below uh, 20 micrograms per cubic meter. It's actually even below uh, 15, 12 micrograms per cubic meter. So still a lot of reduction for the incoming PM 2.5. So here is the color plus again uh, for the BAS data. Um, it, it's just similar to what we are just show you for the passenger vehicle data. We're showing the part, uh, contour plus for um, any given time, any given size, and the concentration uh, for, for that particular cases. Right. The left panel shows on the local route, and the right panel shows uh, the freeway route. And we split, uh, we split the panels into uh, cabin air where uh, actually the filtration is on and versus uh, the filtration is off for both cases. And on top, the top panels is what is going on um, outside of the buses, on road um, and um, measurements. And the lower panel shows what we measure inside the buses, right? So similar results, uh, very similar. If you're comparing just the top panels, similar to what we observed with passenger vehicles, the freeway always have higher levels of nucleation mode um, atrophine particles comparing to the local route. And those particles are small in the nucleation um, size range. And you compare the top panels against the lower, the bottom panels, so you will see, well, for filtration on cases, the color turns a lot green greener and bluer, right? So that shows uh, significant reductions for, for those cases. Right? Where, where, wherever where the filtration is not on, uh, then the, um, the hot spots that we measured on freeways actually can get into the buses, right? The bus levels is inside the bus levels is still quite high comparing to when the filtration is on. And it's similar to what we measured for the passenger vehicles, those reductions happens immediately. It doesn't really take too much time for the filter to work, right? The moment you shut down the filtration, right, the, the pollutant levels go up. Right? The moment you turn on the filtration, the pollutant levels went down. So it's a very effective, uh, quick process for the filter to work, clean up the air inside the buses. And to put those, all the data into perspective, um, we realize uh, for bus data using uh, IO ratio itself, like what we did for passenger vehicles, doesn't make sense because uh, some of the times the IO ratio can be greater than 1.0 because the um, just due to the reasons I just explained. So we actually, um, for best, we try to compare the IO ratio when the HECA filter is on versus the IO ratio when the HECA filter is off. So if anything happens, um, self pollution all parts driven from a high um, pollutant environment into a low in pollutant environment, it's gonna affect the both, the both cases sim uh, similarly. So by comparing these two IO ratios, we can get a real sense about how does the system work in terms of reducing the pollutant levels. So we, we did that for um, school bus data, three conditions, atrophine particles, black carbon, and PM 2.5. See, the, 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 the effect, the, uh, the IO reduction is very high, 88% for atrophines, right? about 85% for black carbon, not as, as high as um, but the other two for PM 2.5. Nevertheless, as I mentioned, the PM 2.5 real level concentration levels get kept low. Uh, um, the, the reason behind that is we're thinking is because the ultrafine levels in the mobile, in the, in the uh, on freeway, on roadway environment is high to start with, versus PM 2.5 is more regional pollutants. You get lots of uh, background levels, not necessarily um, inside just from the traffic uh, direct emissions. So in comparison, we also put the passenger vehicles data here. They have similar levels of reduction. To summarize uh, what we uh, did for phase two of school bus work, the developed uh, onboard filtration system can reduce uh, atrophine black carbon IO ratios by 88% and 85%. It's not that as great for PM 2.5. Nevertheless, it kept the PM 2.5 concentration levels below 12 micrograms per cubic meter in the buses. And 
we think this system has great potential to reduce children's exposure to particular pollutants. And, and it doesn't matter where the pollution sources are, whether it's from um, the on-road traffic or it's from the bus itself. Um, the system all works pretty well. So this is a clearly a uh, proof of concept study pilot level, uh, a very limited scope of work. Um, I'd like to spend a few minutes to talk about the limitations and potential future study that we envision can derive from this study. The developed system um, can have potential to be an effective exposure mitigation for both passenger vehicles and for school buses. Um, however, in this study, due to the scope of the work, we only tested new filters and we only tested a, a very short period of time. So that limits our, the way how we can generalize the, uh, the results into a more broader cases. And for school buses, um, due to the logistic issues and liability issues, we haven't been able to collect the data while children on board. Previously, when I was in Texas, we did get an um, opportunity to collect data with children on board. We actually see some impacts. Um, there's the suspensions, children's activities, can have some impact on the pollutant levels. And we'd like to see if, that, um, if the system can compete with that additional activities and still keep the pollutant levels uh, low. And we think a long-term evaluation is needed before we can make formal recommendations uh, for policy, for policy uh, purposes. Uh, for example, how does the filtration uh, system de decay over time? How does the filter medium degrade um, as a function of time? We, would, we, were, we were not able to answer this question in this, uh, in this study. And the pressure job, we, we noticed that it's, um, it's, uh, it's a um, um, factor, uh, especially for passenger vehicles. Uh, and uh, as the filter is fused over time, pressure likely to be fused up. And how does that develop over time is also not uh, well characterized in this study. And we didn't really study window positions and seasonal variables, temperature humidities, all of those factors wasn't a, a factor in for this pilot uh, study. And uh, with children on board, whether CO2 could be an issue while well, we circulate air inside the buses is also a concern. And then finally, the fuel consumptions when we um, add uh, uh, a little bit of more pressure into the ventilation system, does it really cause the vehicle to burn more fuels to run it or not, um, that's something we don't know. And we like to um, know it for, like to study for, for future studies. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, tumbleweed transportation that provided us um, the access to the buses, AccuAir, they provide um, the filters and the, for both the passenger vehicles and school buses. And there are many students um, in the UCLA team that helps with data collection in the field and Peggy and Mike um, from the research division at ARB always helps us keep um, on track of our projects. And the study is funded clearly by ARB, and there's also some NSF career funding to support um, the work. So far, we have published two uh, publications papers, and I, I want to especially acknowledge my uh, postdoc, Dr. Ian Lee, the first author of both papers. Uh, without Ian, I, I don't think I can be here to present the results today. Um, and with that, this is the references that is used in today's talk. And I thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Zhu. We sure appreciated you coming and giving this great presentation. Um, I guess, first of all, are there questions from the audience? And just so those of you online know, we do have to wait a minute for each person to have the microphone in front of them so you can hear the questions. So. Hi. Go ahead, um, I know that you didn't look at coarse particles um, in, in this um, the study, but with the drought and the potential for more coarse particles to be on the road, um, would that be potentially more of a problem with the filters and the degradation of the filters, or, or how would that affect? Yeah, that, that's state? a very good question. And uh, actually, I, um, I, I would love to measure coarse particles in the filter work, and we actually propose to do it. 
uh, to the research division. Uh, what, b b besides the job uh, issues that you, you mentioned about, and just by uh, driving our road, there are lots of industry suspensions and tailwear um, particles. And, and so far, even the literature, the broad literature for in cabin work haven't uh, been focusing on the quartz part of it. And then the reason that we're thinking um, some of the PM 2.5 data are not as as nicely uh, um, as uh, as the actual fine particles that also make us think maybe some of the coarse particles, the large particles, uh, has some resuspension issues or some filtration efficiency issues that we didn't uh, look uh, carefully enough. And we certainly would love to to look into that. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Anybody? No, we did have one. Oh. Yeah, thank you for an excellent talk. Um, I had a couple of questions. So first was, do you have uh, results for PM 2.5 and black carbon for the passenger cars? And then um, I have a second question on just what potential costs could be for these filters. I, I know that these are prototypes, but just a, a rough idea if they're similar in cost or much higher than um, the ones that are normally installed by the OEMs. And then my last question would be, you had a generally newer vehicles. So with um, older vehicles or as vehicles age um, is and higher air exchange with the outside, do you, would you expect the filters to be more or less or, or equally effective? Right, so those are very good questions. I, I do have data for PM 2.5 and uh, um, passenger and black carbon for passenger vehicles. It's a, I, I realize it's not in the slides, uh, but it's in the paper. It's in the paper that we uh, uh, at, at the end of the talk. So it's, it, the, the EST paper has uh, PM 2.5 and uh, black carbon data and the final report that we're gonna eventually publish for this project um, under AIB's contract will have all the data. Actually, all the raw data, uh, 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 secondary process data, uh, raw data, data table for, for those data. So, so they are available. Um, the second question is for, um, oh, and, and you probably want to know how does that compare to actual fine like in, in relation to buses. It's very similar. Um, the black carbon and actual fines were about the same, 80-90%. Uh, PM 2.5 not as good as um, the actual fines, just like the buses, just like the buses for the same same thing for the same reason um, for passenger vehicles. Uh, and the second question is about the cost. So this is a uh, you can you can you can think about those system as the filters as a customer my customerized um, filter they built for um, individual cars. So the um, the collaborator Acura basically told us they they have to make one. Uh, a module for each individual car. Believe it or not, all the cars that we tested, they have filters of different dimensions. They all have different dimensions, shapes, and, 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 and configurations. So they have to make it um, one for each. So the cost is high for our, including R&D cost. Um, um, so they cost about $100 per pieces uh, for just for the project, just for the project. Uh, it's a little bit higher. Um, and. Um, the third question is, uh, we, as vehicles age, do right, they become as leakier? Age and how does that um, impact the, the the performance, right? We actually, we, we, we couldn't answer that question in this project, but we do have another um, study that is looking at uh, taxi drivers. Uh, how does the filters can help improve um, cabin air quality for taxi drivers for to protect their occupational exposures? And what we realized is they don't add work as well as those newer cars. Uh, one of the reasons behind that is I think the, the, the vehicle's envelope is much leakier than the vehicles that we tested for this particular study. So that's a potential reason. And, and then there's also is when we do our study, we are very strict with window positions um, and how the ventilation is settings. When we work with taxi drivers, we let them choose whatever they want to do. So they sometimes roll down the windows, so the filters like get bypassed. So, so that all contributes to the level of protection that you would expect uh, when you use it for real in the in the in the fleet. Thank you. And we do have one question from the webinar audience. And for those on the webinar, if you have additional questions, by all means, feel free to send them in right now. 
Uh, so Dr. Zhu, if you want to read that, or I can read. Okay, so the question is, was a consideration made for the potential particle contribution from passengers themselves, both before and after picking up in the morning and the same when picking up uh, from school? Um, so, so this is, um, again, this is a question that we would love to answer, but we couldn't answer since the study was done without children on board. Um, this is really about how this, uh, um, the activity of the children um, inside the buses that can potentially impact the in-cabin air quality. There's potential for particle resuspension when children are active, just walking uh, along the, uh, the floors. And there has been literature showing particles can be resuspended. In, even smaller particles can be suspended in indoor environments. So presumably, same, same, uh, same phenomenon can be observed for school buses. And previously, when we were at Texas, we did measure data. We did have data where our, uh, where we collected wind children on board, and there are certain uh, trends, although not um, not statistically significant, but there is certain trends where we see impacts when children on board. So that's something we absolutely want to test in future in future work. Great, thank you. Any other questions in the room? No, uh, right there. Hi, thanks. I had a question about um, positive cabin pressure, and it seems like the um, outside air coming in is going to create positive cabin pressure and therefore reduce the effects of, of a leaky vehicle. But for the school bus where it's a recirculation system, that would be less true, especially if kids are getting on and off and the doors opening and that kind of thing. Did you consider um, a outside air in system? Yeah, so that's a, a very good question. Uh, when, when we test in the passenger vehicle, since we use outdoor air mode, um, the, um, the ventilation system is pressurizing the air and uh, the, the passenger cabin. So that keeps the air from leaking in. And that's, that's um, I think, partially contribute to why the filter works so well when you uh, use uh, outdoor air mode to pressurize the cabin so the leakage doesn't really go through the cracks around the passenger vehicles. And in school buses, because the buses, uh, the one that we worked with, so far, doesn't have a, um, a, a sort of air intake system to build into it, so we couldn't do it. And um, to, to dig holes and put stuff on school buses is a no-no from um, <laughs> California Heavy Patrol um, uh, perspective. It, they, I, I actually feel uh, we're pretty lucky they allow us to put this much inside the buses and still allow us to drive around to collect data. So, so there are some safety uh, policy concerns to, to do things like that. Um, and you're asking whether open doors and closing doors uh, would uh, have some effect. The filter system, um, the, the heater onboard filter system we uh, developed for the school buses is, is a very high power. So, so, so there's a trade-off, right? So there's very high power, so it takes energy, and the flow is high, but it does keep it from, um, uh, you know, sporadic door opens, doesn't really show a dramatic impact. But I didn't have, I actually, I, I didn't show it today, but we do have, slides and figures in the final report where you can see uh, by the moment the door is opening, the indoor-outdoor ratios doesn't really change um, as, as we collect in the data. Um, but the high flow jet that we used for this system can maybe also create lots of turbulence and resuspend some of the uh, coarse particles. So that may partially explain why the PM 2.5 data were not as good as the actual flying data for this case. So that, that all needs to be uh, looked further in, in, um, in, in future work. Yeah, but thank you for the question. Thanks. Okay, and we have one more here from online. Okay, so the question is, um, you briefly mentioned the trade-offs, but can you uh, elaborate on the cost of the increased pressure job and running this system, right? So this is something that we couldn't, uh, uh, we haven't uh, systematically collected data to answer. To, to answer um, um, the trade-off between the cost of increased pressure job and running the systems, we probably need to do a long-term study, first of all, to see how the pressure builds up over time and how does the fuel consumption, fuel assumption or change over time and uh, what additional, um, we need to use to run the system 
And so far, we only tested um, very briefly for each vehicle, so, so it didn't give enough time to, um, for, for, for those things to show up. And then that's not the focus for this, uh, this and the scope of the work for this particular project. But those are important questions. Um, one of the study limitations and future uh, work directions that I think should worth, worth looking into. Do you have any sense for how much pressure I, I drop you would expect? I think it's going to cost a lot, um, just from the data that we see. Uh, it's uh, uh, on a range of less than 10% of a pressure reduction. It wouldn't be too much. Uh, in, in, from um, you know energy consumption's perspective, I wouldn't think that is a big big uh, uh, issue there. But the filter cost and then maintenance and, and exchange and all of those, how does that? Um, I guess you can do some kind of like a cost effective or, or analysis to see the benefits that you reduce the pollution exposures and the health benefits you gain out of it versus the cost of it. So there are. Uh, ways I think you can you can look into it. That's just not my area of expertise, but I know there are uh, researchers working in this area. Okay, other questions? No, nope. I have one uh, that actually I I brought up with uh, Dr. Zhu earlier today. Um, she and her students have a paper that just came out I think in Atmospheric Environment, which they did some modeling to look at leakiness of. Uh, the school buses, and of course, as Dr. Zhu knows, you know, of great interest A or B is the fact that we see self-pollution with school buses. We've done some work, hopefully, to try to reduce that. So maybe could you share um, kind of some of the key findings, and in particular, I think what what you folks found in terms of the location of the, the right. tailpipe that might help. Yeah, thanks, uh, Peggy. So this, that study was a fluid dynamic modeling work. Basically, we are trying to simulate in a, um, in a, in a, you know, idealize the situations where you have a school bus that have tailpipes in different locations, like what we observe in the field. The field, uh, like for example, in uh, this size here, as you can see, the buses they have um, different uh, different configurations. Right? The exhaust. Oh, sorry. The exhaust. You mentioned the number. Of the, slides. the number oh, yeah, slides 25. Right. So, so as you can see, the exhaust location sometimes is in the rear right and rear left and sat left and rear left. Right. So, so they can have different exhaust locations. So when we did the study, we uh, were thinking maybe the locations have something to do with how the exhaust leave um, the buses and then the fluid dynamically get attracted back and then penetrate and, and leak into the bus cabin. So we did a modeling work uh, based on idealized the situation and then we realized the, the, the exhaust locations does have some impacts. Uh, for example, when the, the exhaust location is on the side, then the, the, the momentum from coming from the tailpipe or likely to push the exhaust away from this, uh, the bus uh, back door. And then when the bus is driving, so the, the pressure uh, field around the bus create a negative pressure that tend to suck the air from the back door into the cabin. And then if you don't have exhaust that directly in this sort of like a hot zone, then you have less um, chances to get the, exhaust, the bus exhaust back to its own cabin. So that is a potential, um, potential way that we can explore, but certainly I'm thinking the, the modeling work is always done in idealized situations while the bus is really driving. There are turbulence that's created by surrounding vehicles. How does that um, play a role in it? I, I think it really deserves some field work to, 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 to um, carefully characterize it. OK, thank you. Uh, any other questions today? No? Nope. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Zhu. We appreciate your talk again. Thank you. And for those of you on the web, if you have further questions, if you email them, we can pass them on to Dr. Zhu. So we're going to do an interview. Uh, no.